let's uh, let's move on to Connor next. Um, okay, Connor, and I, I see at least one of your co-authors is in the in the room as well. So yeah, Fabian's um, in the chat. So if you have any questions that I'm not answering, I'm sure he'll get to that. Right. So we've got Connor Walsh telling us about skilled scalable services. Go ahead, Connor. Thank you very much. You'll see my screen. Yep. Perfect. Great. So yeah, this is this is joint with Fabian, who's here, and uh, Sharat Ganapati at Georgetown. Um, so I guess what this paper is about is that historically it's been the case that a, a fairly robust fact of economic growth is that poor areas tend to grow their incomes faster than rich areas. Indeed, we know from from the classic JPE of uh, Barrow and Sally Martin that. You know, poorer U.S. states for most of U.S. history saw their incomes grow by about 1% more than richer states, and this led to a long, slow period of convergence across space. But there's been a number of recent papers that have documented that sometime around 1980, this process actually stopped. And indeed, there's been a new urban bias in economic growth in that the richest densest cities in the US have seen the fastest income gains, persistently faster wage growth over the last sort of 40 years. So we do two things in this paper. First, we're going to show you that essentially all of this urban bias in the last 40 years in economic growth is accounted for by a small number of service industries that we call skilled scalable services. And basically all of the urban bias is happening within these services outside these services, essentially not much has changed. And the second thing we're going to do on top of documenting that is we're going to give you an explanation that we think is, is kind of compelling. We're going to show you that what's special about these services is, well, they use a lot of ICT in keeping with uh, today's theme. They're very skill intensive. And you can, we're going to show you that if you just take the ICT price declines that we've seen in the data, uh, and interact them with the comparative advantage of cities, you can reproduce quantitatively a lot of the trends that we see in the data for these services. So what are these services? Well, fundamentally, they're services that are skill intensive, that create and communicate information. And we think about the role of ICT in these services as helping to expand their scale. ICT both increases the volume of information they can create and the, and the quality of the information they can create and trade with other industries. So what we're gonna to do to define them is for each two digit Nike service industry, we're gonna compute the skill intensity of that service industry. And basically we'll just call that the share of college workers in the workforce and the ICT intensity of that industry, where we're just gonna take that from national accounts as the share of software and hardware in the total capital stock. And we'll call skilled scalable services those two digit NYX industries that have the highest rankings in both of these measures. So what does that look like? Well, here I'm plotting on the X axis, the uh, ICT intensity rank of all the services in the US economy. And then on the Y axis, I'm plotting the skill intensity rank. And we'll call skilled scalable services these four service industries up here. So management of companies, which is basically headquarters, professional services, information, which is tech, and finance and insurance. So you can see there's a lot of sort of heterogeneity. There's a bunch of service industries that use a lot of ICT, but aren't really that skill intensive. There are some service industries like kind of what we do that are very skill intensive, education and health healthcare, but don't actually use a lot of ICT. And then there's some service industries that are neither intensive in both these measures. So things like retail, accommodation, food services. And what we see in the data is that these three quadrants tend to behave kind of similarly in the time series and across space is really these, this upper right hand quadrant that looks, looks very different. Can I just uh, pause there, Connor? Yeah, um, please. I just wanted to ask you about sort of retail, transportation, warehousing. I thought we knew that, uh, you know, Walmart's productivity growth, which was all about supply chain management, contributed like percentage points to US productivity growth in the 90s. That's not showing up here. Uh, I, well, I'm, in what sense? I'm not showing anything about accounting for productivity growth here. I'm just, I'm just ranking the industries essentially. Well, that, it's it, it, that, 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 that supply chain management relies on ICT. 
True. I mean, so this intensity is maybe not capturing, this intensity measure is maybe not capturing the importance of ICT for these. For Walmart, spectres. yeah. So, I mean, a lot of what we're going to be doing is establishment based. So we'll see things like headquarter services, which you'll, you, you might expect a lot of the gains to the ICT intensification of Walmart accrue to the workers who work at the headquarters. And that's kind of what we see. So essentially, if you're in, if you're a low skill worker working in branches of Walmart or CVS or whatever across space, you don't really see any intensive wage gains. It's really the skill intensive uh, headquarter services that see most of the divergence. But, but let me show you the, the facts first and then we can, we can talk about whether this is the right ranking. So, and yeah, just for the rest of the talk, I'm, I'm gonna save myself some space and I'm gonna call skilled scalable services just by the acronym SSS. So what does the new urban bias look like in the data? Well, this is one kind of very simple way of showing it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take all the commuting zones in the US and I'm gonna put them into 10 bins with equally with equal amounts of population in each bin. And I'm gonna plot the average wage in that bin relative to the first decile. So this, this largest bin is essentially two or three cities. It's New York and Chicago. And then the, the smallest bin is many, many small commuting zones. And they have about a 10th of the US population in each one of these bins. And yeah, so I'm plotting the average wage in, these, in this top density decile versus relative to the smallest density decile in each bin. What you can see is that this is, this is one way to measure the urban wage gradient, essentially how, um, the, how wages increase with density. This is controlling for absolutely nothing. This is just aggregate wages. And since 1980, this gradient has gotten a fair bit steeper. So it used to be that you know, a, work, an, a, a random worker in New York would make about 40% more uh, than a worker in the smallest commuting zones in the US. Now it's about 60% more. So if you break this out across industries, if you just take out the four SSS industries, you essentially get that the urban wage gradient hasn't changed at all. Uh, there's essentially no difference between 1980 and 2015, the average wages um, relative to the smallest places in the US. And this whole, you can disaggregate this even further. This is all the non-SSS uh, industries. You can disaggregate this uh, quite a bit further and you get a very similar result. So where's all the action coming from? Well, it's the SSS industries. So in, in 1980, again, SSS workers on average would make about 40% uh, more than in New York than the, the really smallest places. In 2015, it's more than double, essentially. Now this is controlling for nothing and I'm gonna show you a, a fair bit about what's going on. Obviously there've been skill intensity changes across space in this, in this period and I'm gonna disaggregate that for you. So I'm gonna start by documenting some of the facts that, that lie behind this change in the urban wage density gradient essentially. And to do so, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a couple of the major US labor market data sets. So we're gonna use the LBD, which is the census establishment, the, uni the universe of establishments uh, in the US and that's payroll employment zip codes uh, for almost all establishments since 1980. And that comes from the business register and tax records. We'll, you, we'll supplement that with the QCEW, uh, which is a public, ver public data that you can look at, which is very similar stuff, pa payroll and employment for county, county and industries since 1990. And um, that comes from a different data source, unemployment insurance program receipts, but a lot of the, uh, pretty much everything I'm gonna say holds consistently across these two data sets. And since we can't really have a measure of skill in either one of these, we're also gonna supplement the analysis with just the decennial census and the American Community Survey which is microdata since 1980. And that'll give us a measure of skill of workers across space. So the first fact I wanna show you is that there's been rapid and urban bias wage growth in SSS. So if I take just the average wages by industry in, at, in, in the macro economy since 1980, and I plot them relative to 1980 over the last sort of 40 years, most industries have seen their average wages evolved pretty similarly since 1980. There's been sort of 35 to 40% growth. This is real wages, by the way, I've, I've de deflated by the CPI here. But SSS looks like it's just on a completely different trajectory altogether. So it's seen its real wages, uh, you know, adjusting by CPI more than double in this time period. Okay. 
What does that look like? One question about the data yes, here. So, so this is from the LBD? Uh, this is the QCEW. Um, if you do it in the LBD, you get a very similar sort of trend. The thing is, you have to do a lot of disclosure if you want to get each one of these data points. So we took out five-year intervals, but this is every year since 1980. So, so then in terms of definition of sectors, just going back to my question, so yeah. an establishment is defined, so, you know, it's like uh, Walmart HQ will be defined as retail or it will no, be... No, Walmart HQ as... will be SSS for us and a Walmart retail establishment will be uh, retail. Okay, so it's de defined at the level of the, uh, established, of the establishment, not, not at the industry code. Exactly. Yeah. So, we, I mean, in the LBD, at least we can assign industry codes to each establishment and we'll and we'll aggregate that way. And just um, yeah. when you're deflating by the CPI, are they, are they um, place-based CPIs or just the national no, one? No, this, this picture is just purely national. Okay. But you, you'll do something about that later on, right? Certainly. Gotcha. So um, what does it look like across space? Well, again, th this, this picture will be the LBD. We're going to take, again, those 10 density decile bins and I'm going to plot the wage growth within industry in these density decile bins relative to the first decile. So you can see there's really not been much or any uh, systematic urban bias across industries uh, outside of SSS. So wages haven't really grown faster in these top, top density decile bins relative to the smallest places in the US. But again, SSS just looks very different. So wage growth uh, in, in, if you're in an SSS establishment in, say, New York or San Francisco is in this ninth density decile bin, you're going to see much, much faster wage growth uh, than, than the first density decile bin. So that's just wages, like I said, controlling and disaggregating for nothing. Obviously, some of that is going to reflect the skill composition, changing skill compositions both in the aggregate and across space. So what's been going on with skill compositions? Well, there's been rapid and urban bias skill deepening in SSS as well. So if you look at the college, non-college worker ratio, which is kind of the relevant statistic in, in most macro models, um, and you just plot this relative to 1980 across industries, there's definitely been a fair bit of skill deepening since 1980, and this has occurred across industries. But SSS just again looks like it's on a completely different trajectory. So the college non-college worker ratio has gone up by like 250% in SSS. And remember, I define these services as being particularly skill intensive in 1980. So this is starting off of a very high base and they're becoming much, much more skill intensive, much faster than, than any other industry. What about across space? Well, I'll use the, the decennial censuses for these. And I'll show you the growth in the college non-college worker ratio relative to that first density decile again. And so you see here that across industries, there has been uh, urban bias skill deepening. It's certainly the case that skilled workers generally are moving to cities across, US, across the US, but across industries, they seem to be doing it at a fairly kind of constant rate across industries, except for in SSS. So there we just see like sort of massive skill deepening for this particular group of industries uh, um, relative to that first decile. Now, in reference to that first fact I was talking about, you might ask, well, how much of that faster wage growth uh, in, in SSS that's occurring in these dense places is just the skill deepening? So we do a bunch of decompositions in the paper, basically about 30 to 40% of, of the outsized wage growth in the densest places represents skill deepening, but most of it is actually fast wage growth within skill, skill groups across space that's causing the urban wage uh, gradient to, to shift upwards for these services. Just sorry, just one other data question. Yeah, please. This. So uh, this is based on occupations or based on the industry in which you work? The industry in which you work. So I'll say a little bit more about occupations in a sec, but this is all industry classification. So if I work at Walmart yeah. in Walmart headquarters, in this case, I'm not going to end up in skilled scalable services. I'm going to end up somewhere else. Uh, no, I mean, if sorry, uh, maybe I, I missed that. But if, if you on the census, if you say you work uh, in Oh, yes. No, that, that, that's exactly right. Exactly right. So you're going to be classified by whatever the census says uh, what, you're in this, what industry you're in. 
Oh, but yeah. I'm, I'm confused now. NAICS industry codes are assigned at the level of establishments. So if they, you they are in- for the LBD. This is this when we're talking about skills, uh, we don't observe education in the LBD. So this is all from the decennial census. Okay, so that I guess depends on whether the worker correctly interprets the question about what industry that they should be saying they work in headquarters services. Right. Okay. Right. That's exactly right. So yeah, I, I agree. There's some measurement issues here. This is kind of the best we can do with with the data that's available. I think. Yeah, just just on that, Jonathan, I think it, you know in the in the appendix we do a little bit of we kind of compare, for example, you know in in the location of the Walmart headquarter, we we compare the LBD and the census, and it really seems that you know there are some workers who are saying they work in retail, you know, in retail when they work at Walmart headquarters instead of I you know, the headquarters. Uh, we are a little bit we kind of we are quite we are kind kind of okay for with that I think because the bias would go in the other direction. So it would be people who are actually in SSS, you know, misclassifying themselves as 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 uh, retail and hence kind of bringing up the the skill ratio in retail, which it doesn't seem to be very strong in this graph. Right. Cool. So uh, the third fact I want to talk about is there's been rapid and urban biased ICT capital adoption in SSS. So again, I'll start with the aggregate. Uh, here, I'm going to plot the technology share of, cap- of the capital stock, the software and hardware across industries since 1980. So it's true, or pretty much all industries are getting more ICT intensive during this period. But again, SSS started off uh, at a high base and has been sort of rapidly intensifying their ICT investments as a share of the, of the total cap- capital stock since 1980. Across space, well, uh, we're kind Sorry of- Sorry to keep banging on on this. Uh, no, so in this, in this previous figure, so Walmart is in skilled sal- scalable services or where is Walmart? Uh, for this, yeah. The, I mean, this is just the, the BEA asset tables. And so you're counting up the total share of, of capital at the industry level. And that's a good point. I don't know what Walmart would be classified as here. I don't think they split it out by establishment. It's probably done at the firm level, but I need to- I need to check that for sure. Um, And well, that's relevant to what I'm saying right here. So in the census, at least, we have some micro data on on ICT investments coming from a couple of surveys and the the capital expenditure survey. Uh, It's it's also done at the firm level, but what we're gonna do is apportion the uh, ICT investment to each establishment in proportion to employment. And when we do that, we, get, we, we can compute some measure of software investment per employee at the establishment level. And we can plot out the urban bias of this software investment um, sort of in a kind of a consistent manner. And if you look at the other industries, there doesn't really seem to be much of an urban bias in the ICT software investment, but you do see it quite strongly in, in SSS in that uh, you know, SSS industries do concentrate more in dense cities, it's true, and they're doing much more ICT investment. But even accounting for that, you see kind of a, a stronger gradient uh, here of software investment per employee for, for SSS than you do outside. Um, yeah, I wish I had ICT spending at the establishment level, but I don't. This is sort of what we've got. This is software. We're kind of bringing, we're, we're still uh, waiting for disclosure on this. We're going to bring out hardware investment per employee. Uh, quite soon. Okay, so just to summarize that, um, rapid wage growth in SSS, the urban bias is only in SSS industries. There's been rapid skill deepening in SSS, and you see far more urban bias in SSS than other industries, and there's been rapid ICT adoption in SSS, and urban bias looks like it's only there for for the SSS establishments. Now, we do a whole bunch of sort of robustness and and discussion of these facts in the paper. One thing we get asked about a lot is, is is this really an industry story? Is is this an occupation story? We have some things we can say about this. Uh, Basically, what it looks like in the census is that if you classify, so uh, the natural thing you might ask about, is this just all cognitive non-routine occupations? uh, And is SSS just a stand-in for cognitive non-routine occupations? Basically, what we see in the census is that if you're in a CNR occupation, but you're not in SSS, you really don't see any urban bias wage growth. Uh, So like our our example that we always bring up is doctors. So doctors have seen essentially flat wage growth across space. So their wages are growing and growing kind of nicely, 
but they're not doing it in an, in an urban bias way. Uh, if you're in a non-CNR occupation, but you are in SSS, you, you're also seeing urban bias wage growth. So, you know, it, in, in shorthand, basically the secretaries at, at big banks and Goldman Sachs, they're also doing quite well and they've seen their wages change in an urban bias way. So occupations is not really a, a sufficient statistic to talk about industry. We really do think this is happening at the industry level, not, not the, the occupation level. So uh, yeah, so that's, that's in terms of sort of just data, what, explaining the urban bias wage growth just in terms of a set of industries. Now we're gonna give you what we think is an explanation for, for or a quantitative explanation for we, what we think is going on. So we're gonna construct a model of skilled scalable services and other industries uh, uh, and, and think about the adoption or in the incentives to adopt ICT across space. So to do this, I'm going to think of a setting where the economy is just a discrete set of locations. And before, you, before you get there, can you, can you just tell us, <clears throat> I missed it. Can you tell the story for why this ends up um, concentrating in the biggest cities? I, yes, I, I mean, that's essentially what I'm going, to, I'm going to do now with the model. So, I mean, SSS industries, they've always concentrated in dense cities um, long before the arrival of ICT. So there's some sort of fundamental productive advantage to doing SSS type work in dense cities. We, in this paper, we don't really get into modeling what that is. We're gonna take that just as given as a fact that there's some advantage to being in a dense city for, for, for doing SSS. And we're gonna think about the interaction of those comparative advantages at the industry level across space with an aggregate decline in the price of ICT. And as ICT becomes cheaper, it's going to naturally be you're going to want to invest most in ICT in the places that have comparative advantage for SSS. Given that SSS is going to use ICT most intensively, you're going to get biased ICT investment across space. Okay. So, Connor, just to clarify, yeah. since you have SSS defined as both in its skill intensity and the ICT, then yeah. just being intensive in ICT doesn't benefit in the same way from the price decline. There's got to be some bias in the, the skill bias in the ICT price decrease, right? Definitely. So uh, I'll talk about that right now. Exactly. So yeah, it's not just, it's also a skill ratio story that we think, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that now. Can you also just say, I mean, just since you're, you're, you are talking about certain industries that tend to be high paying industries. Um, mm -hmm. And you might think that like tax policy is somehow related to um, how those those people in those industries are compensated. Is that not something that we need to think about, you know, with, with the, the massive change in marginal tax rates for finance guys or um, high income guys? Um, yeah, um, probably. We don't have a lot to say about uh, taxes, I guess. I mean, the, the one thing, you know, we always find it helpful to think about is well, do these necessarily have spatial implications if you have if you just take take the tax rate and change it for for finance workers? Mm -hmm. Would that cause finance wages to go up disproportionately in New York? It's not clear to me that it would. I mean, I'm sure you could cook up some story, but I think well, we have a progressive. I mean, we, we have a progressive tax system, and it is more expensive to to live in New York. And so, if you cut the marginal tax rates for the highest guys, it's makes it more valuable to live in New York, um, so. Yeah, I, I, it's a fair point. It's something okay. we haven't put a lot of thought to. But. Okay, Th that's fine. Yeah. Thanks. I got the intuition now, thank you. Um, Connor, I don't, maybe, go ahead. I'm gonna piggyback on George's comment because I think you've mostly shown us price growth stuff. You haven't really shown us much about quantities, right? So, to, you know, the finance sector has a lot of kind of people in it. One is like, you know, your community bank branch in Iowa and the other one is a hedge fund on Wall Street. And mm -hmm. if, you know, only one of those responds to a change in tax policy, you see wage growth. I think you can, or you probably will discipline this in the model where you'll use quantity of labor and people migrating and stuff to, to say whether it's, you know, just the same people making higher returns versus. That, yeah, that's people. right. Uh, so, I mean, we do a fair bit of that in the, in the paper, I and mean, I'm going to show you now some of it. But essentially, one thing to keep in mind with SSS is that the the overall employment share of SSS hasn't changed much since 1980. 
So while we've seen a lot of skill deepening of these services, you're essentially getting low skill workers leave these services. So those kind of relative skill changes are going to help us say something about what, what is going on when, when aggregate prices change. Um, but yeah, maybe I'll be able to clarify a bit more when I, when I get to the model. Um, anyone else before I start digging into this? So yeah, essentially we're going to think about a discrete set of locations and there's going to be some masses of high and low skill labor in the, in the, uh, uh, in the mm -hmm. aggregate, sorry. And workers are going to choose two things in, in both these skill groups. They're going to choose what sector they want to work in, which can either just be SSS or it can be non-SSS. And they're going to choose a location they want to live in. And locations are going to differ in their sectoral comparative advantage, essentially. So some locations are just going to be fundamentally good at doing SSS and some are not. And we're not going to get into the reasons why that might be. We're going to take that as some given exogenous feature of the economy. Now, output within each sector and each location is going to be produced by heterogeneous firms. Uh, and I'll specify what they are in a sec. But uh, the other thing I'll say is the environment's just static. We kind of punt on the dynamics here. We're going to think about a sequence of static equilibria as the aggregate ICT price changes. And all markets are just perfectly competitive on the outside, output side. So just There's to be clear, point. so- Sorry. Yes, oh, please. Go ahead. Doreen. Uh, uh, so, so a firm here in some sense is an establishment yes. because it's, it has a lo location attached to it. Yes, so yeah. you're not getting into this sort of uh, ICT span of control type stuff that uh, no, Danielle we're not. was talking about. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're not. Um, we, we think it's interesting, we're, we're gonna, we're essentially going to be looking at the establishment level and not kind of the firm choice about where to expand to in, in space. But I agree, those are important considerations for thinking about these sort of things. And there's a coincidence between the location's comparative advantage and their size to get the urban bias. In equilibrium, there will be. In particular, more productive locations will host more people just, just uh, in equilibrium. But we'll take that initial distribution as kind of given and then we'll see how it changes as we change some of the macro parameters. But it's not just the level of productivity, it's the comparative advantage in SSS, right? Right, that's right. Um, the, the model I'm gonna talk about has really sort of three ingredients. So one is scale at the firm level or the establishment level. So ICT Capital, we're gonna think about it allowing SSS firms to expand their scale. Uh, and we're going to think about ICT as a fixed cost technology that allows you to lower the marginal costs of production of, of knowledge or the output goods of SSS. And like we were just saying, there can be different local returns to scale due to local comparative advantage. Some places are naturally good at doing these sort of uh, activities, and that's going to interact with the investment decision about how much ICT to, to adopt. And third, uh, we're going to think about changes in ICT potentially changing the skill intensity at the firm level. In particular, that there might be skill deepening with scale. So we're going to adopt a non-homothetic CES production following on from, from look, looking what, like what Daniel did in, in, in a somewhat similar way. Um, and it's, it's quite important that you do this. If you, if you only think about this as kind of a macro uh, framework for, for ICT adoption, thinking about sort of, I don't know, uh, Crisell, Hanyan, Rius, Rule, Violante, you, you get very counterfactual predictions for what should happen to low skill workers across space as, as you get ICT and CT intensification in dense cities. In particular, without some sort of non homothetic that we're going to present, you get like a massive increase in demand for low skill workers in New York that is just kind of completely counterfactual. So we think these kind of ingredients are, are pretty necessary to, to think about what's going on in the data. But what we're going to look at is sort of each firm having a non-homothetic CES production function where output is going to depend on a couple of things. So output at the firm level is going to depend on some firm level efficiency term Z. It's going to depend on the mix of high skill and low skill labor that you employ, where the marginal productivities of these high skill and low skill labor uh, are both going to depend on scale. So Y is actually going to be defined implicitly as the solution to this equation at the firm level. 
So if you have more output, that's going to affect the marginal productivity of high skill labor relative to low skill labor. Um, and here are these, these alphas are going to be local comparative advantage terms or local productivity shifters showing up that also influence the marginal productivity of high and low skill labor in a location at the firm level. So yeah, outputs defined implicitly as the solution to this. Um, you're going to have a fixed cost technology and you can pay a fixed cost C in units of the final good to invest in ICT capital. So the ICT capital decision is really a two stage thing. First, you need to pay a fixed cost to decide whether you're going to invest in ICT at all. And second, you're going to be able to choose how much capital uh, you want to invest in after you've made that uh, fixed cost decision. And if you choose to pay that ICT fixed cost, your efficiency is going to improve from some baseline level that's idiosyncratic across firms. Uh, and it's going to increase by the amount of ICT capital that you choose to adopt, where K, you can choose as much K as you want. And there's some sort of diminishing returns to efficiency in ICT capital after you've, after you've decided to adopt. Z, that, that fundamental efficiency, we're just going to assume that's drawn from some exogenous distribution across space that's spatially invariant. So all the, the differences come from these comparative advantage terms, and they also come from the endogenous decisions about how much capital to adopt. Um, so, so, a quick question. Yeah. You don't have the sort of spillover effects that, say, Elisa has in her job market paper. I just wondered if you'd thought about putting in maybe the, the, the um, location level wise rather than the firm level wise in this production function. Yeah, I mean, you could do that. You could make these, these alphas say, these like uh, fundamental productivities uh, in a sector and a region depend on say the amount of skilled labor in space. I think what we're gonna show you is you really don't need to think about an endogenous mechanism of, of agglomeration to generate most of what's going on in the data. You can just take those comparative advantages as sort of given in 1980 and vary just one macro price and you'll get most of the action about what's going on. Um, we can, I mean, we can't obviously rule out interesting agglomeration stories where places endogenously become more productive as skilled people move in. What we're gonna show you is you don't need to think about that to, to generate what's going on in the data. So one question about um, this, are, are you going to get the predictions then on the establishment size, how the establishment size changes? You are. Yeah, you are. So we, and we're going to, uh, I don't actually have the slide here, I should have put it in, but we do sort of generate size predictions across space as you change the ICT price. And that's kind of one sort of model validation exercise we consider, and we do fairly well on that. Connor, is um, one of the industries ICT and what's happening there? You didn't highlight it. In yeah, I, I didn't. I was trying to keep it kind of simple. But yeah, SSS is going to be particularly good at using ICT. Uh, ICT is going to be particularly productive in SSS and the other industry, not so much. So that's how we're going to get uh, SSS adopting the ICT. I mean, the production of ICT itself, is it oh, in SSS? No. So, so, yeah. So the production of ICT is just going to happen at the aggregate level and you're going to transform the final good into ICT capital at some constant rate of substitution. And changing that rate of substitution is going to be what changes the price. So we're going to think about like just some exogenous technological improvement in the uh, efficiency of ICT capital production that we think that, you know, just looks like Moore's law. And that's going to exogenously vary the ICT price in the aggregate. But how about in the data? Was the ICT industry among the SSS? Uh, yes. It, so, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of things to say is, uh, Information itself is not just that, it's also sort of the, you know, the software industry. So people who use ICT very intensively, but I agree that there's some part of hardware production uh, in ICT capital production that we're sort of just punting on. It's kind of hidden in the background and we're just going to embed that at the aggregate level. Um, but you might think as well that SSS becomes more productive itself because the ICT, because of technological improvements in ICT production, but that's sort of not here, I guess. So I guess what we should probably think about is breaking out information into those two, two components and saying, well, how much of the, the wage 
trends we think about are coming from the production of ICT versus the use of ICT. That's, that's a great point. Thank you. Um, okay. So yeah, these, these different regional comparative advantages, they're going to lead to a cutoff essentially where that cutoff that the firm level efficiency above which you decide to adopt ICT capital is going to be lower in locations with comparative advantage in SSS. Now, crucially, that's also going to give you faster productivity growth or, or unbalanced productivity growth in locations with initially higher productivity just from one aggregate change. And I'll show you how that works in a second, but let me just describe briefly kind of what else is in the model. Well, we, we're going to take very standard uh, preferences for workers across both place and sectors. Given you've chosen to live in a place, you're going to just have kind of these uh, standard uh, Frache draws of working in a sector at the sectoral level, given you've chosen to live in a place where your sectoral choice depends in the, on the wage in the sector and potentially some sectoral amenity terms. And then spatial labor supply is going to look similar. You're going to just draw again, uh, you're going to be maximizing over the expected wage. You're going to essentially draw your preference shock for locations first. And then once you get to the place, you're going to draw your preference for, for working in either sector. So you're going to be maximizing over this kind of, uh, you know, Frache average wage, let's say. Um, so just to illustrate how the main mechanism is kind of going to work, just first think of just one type of labor and one sector, and you can der derive all kind of this analytically. So you'd get average productivity across firms in a location. If I just average over the Zs, it's going to co consist of two components. So the first is going to be some funda that fundamental efficiency draw, which is the same across space. And the second is going to be an endogenous component which depends on the adoption decisions of ICT that differs across space. You're going to be integrating above the cutoff where that cutoff differs across space, uh, the extra component of efficiency that's coming from ICT capital adoption. So then changes in the price of ICT capital, that uniform price in the macro, is going to affect average productivity through essentially two channels. First, you're going to affect the inframarginal firms the firms that are already above the cutoff and have decided to adopt ICT, they're going to adopt more ICT. And second, you're going to affect the marginal firm. You're going to lower the adoption cutoff as you change the price. So you can actually draw this all out analytically and, and think about these two separate effects, the direct effect just being uh, uh, the inframarginal firms and the indirect effect being the change in the cutoff. And Basically, what you're going to get is a, a uniform decline in, in P you can show is going to cause faster productivity growth in places that already had a high cutoff, which is a low cutoff, which is places that, that had a comparative advantage in SSS. And this is going to give you a source of spatially biased labor demand growth. So you're going to see labor demand, uh, particularly for skilled workers, but in this one type model, only, only the one type of worker grow faster in, in denser uh, richer locations. Cecilia, did you want to say something or you're all good? Cool. So kind of how would that work in equilibrium? Well, if you think about the supply and demand for workers, just this one type of worker, say I've only got two locations and I think about the supply curves for workers across these locations coming from these sectoral choices. Uh, and I think about the demand for workers coming from, um, coming from the firm side. You can think about, say, the blue location and the green location, the blue location having both a fun higher fundamental advantage for, for SSS production and also uh, being a nicer place to live, so having an equilibrium, a, a, a lower intercept on the labor supply curve. If you just think about the initial urban wage gradient as the locus of these two equilibrium points, what's going to happen if you have spatially biased labor demand growth, well, you're going to get the labor demand curve in, this, in that second place, the one that's really productive, it's going to shift to the right and you're going to get an increase in the slope of this locus between the two points. Okay. Now that's just for a two location, very simple example. You can show this quite generally. Basically, if the correlation between sort of the, the fundamental amenities, amenities of a place, how nice it is to work and the initial uh, productivity terms is, is, is positive, then growth is going to be urban bias. 
So basically what that, the interpretation of that is larger places are going to be need to be easier places to expand scale, larger places being, being nice places to live. And we can sort of test a version of this in the, in the quantitative section uh, and, and we show kind of support for this, this condition. So I, I don't have that much time left. So maybe let me just briefly sketch what we do in the quantitative exercise. So like I said, we're going to treat the ICT price essentially as exogenous. We're just going to take it from the data and think of this as being the fundamental driving force in the economy. Think of it like Moore's law. There's just some fundamental exogenous technical progress going on in ICT capital production. And we're going to calibrate the model to the 1980 cross section of US cities. And we're going to basically exactly match uh, wages, quantities of high skill and low skill labor across space uh, in 1980. And we're going to trace out the general equilibrium prediction across space of the model in response to this one uniform ICT price decline. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're basically going to for a, a calibrated version of the model, when we take the fundamental parameters, we're going to saturate the model and recover these local comparative advantage terms, amenities, and sectoral amenities to exactly match that data in 1980. Uh, but we, to do that, we're going to need to be able to get these production parameters from somewhere. So we do a bunch of things. The important ones are essentially these non-homotheticity parameters and the substitution between high skill and low skill labor at the firm level. So to get these, we're basically going to calibrate the model to essentially a shift share regression that's valid in the world of the model. If you think changes in those fundamental productivities are, are unrelated to their initial levels, essentially. So saying, well, what would the world look like if the only thing that was changing in a spatially biased way was just the, the endogenous component of, of investment decisions and all the fundamentals were just changing in kind of random ways. So we'll get this from a shift share regression, essentially, and that'll so, get so us the non. -homotism. One question here: so this yeah. this approach, if you had agglomeration, does this is this still valid under? Uh, it, it's not. You can adjust this for agglomeration, but then you're going to need some other measure of the strength of agglomeration forces. So how, like the 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 local comparative advantage terms, how they respond to change just in the quantities of skilled labor across space. So if that was true, this, this, this regression that we do wouldn't be valid, but you would, you would be able to adjust for it if you had some other source of variation that could identify the strength of agglomeration spillovers. But we don't have that and, and we don't do that. Um, and for labor supply elasticities, well, we'll estimate our own sectoral labor supply elasticities and we'll take the spatial labor supply elasticities from the data. I mean, one thing you might think is kind of missing here, aren't we just like punting on house prices? Where are house prices in this? Well, I mean, as I guess many of us know, it, you can write a version of this with house prices that is isomorphic to what we've written down. And all that's going to change is the interpretation of the labor supply elasticity parameter across space. So if you, uh, yeah, if you, if you take labor supply elasticity estimates from the data, I can always write a version of the model with house prices that'll give you the same movements in quantities of labor across space in response to changing investment decisions. That's if the housing supply elasticity is common across all locations? Exactly, yeah, that's, that's okay. exactly true. If you had heterogeneous uh, uh, housing supply elasticities, you wouldn't get that. But I think a, a feature of the data would be the places that are at the top of the CZ distribution are places where it's pretty inelastic. And that's why it shows up so much in prices and not quantities. That's true. I mean, again, you could sort of, you could get that, well, you could model that in this way without house prices, just by having different labor supply elasticities to place, right? Sure, sure. Okay. We haven't done that, but that's a good point. We probably should do that and see how the, the results change. Um, so back to this new urban bias in the model. Well, this, this is both data, uh, 1980 and 2015. Like I said, in the model, we're going to exactly match all commuting zones, uh, the, the prices and quantities in 1980. So that 1980 line is both data and model. And then we're going to vary the ICT price uh, uh, from 1980 to 2015, the change that we see in the data. And this is essentially the urban bias you would get in the model just from this one aggregate price change. So you do pretty well in matching the overall steepening of the urban wage gradient. Uh, 
you get essentially no movement out of out of SSS. You get, I mean, you get a little bit. There's some relative price changes going on at the sectoral level that that kind of gives you a little bit of urban bias here, but really essentially none because non-SSS is not adopting much ICT capital in this model. But uh, yeah, in the in the data you, and in the model, you get you essentially recover most of the urban bias increase for SSS. You understate a little bit what's going on in these top, top cities. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One thing kind of on Jonathan's point, we don't fully, we aren't fully able to generate the, the movement of skilled labor to New York and San Francisco just from this ICT price decline. And there's a bunch of reasons why that probably is. I mean, there's been some great papers thinking about endogenous amenities uh, in response to movements in skilled workers across space. I mean, it's probably true that New York and San Francisco got a lot nicer uh, since 1980. I mean, both in terms of crime and, and you know the kind of restaurants and all the things that are available there. And part of that is contributing to why we don't fully match the, the increase in the, the average wage gradient across space. We don't get fully enough movement of skilled workers into these top density deciles but we get a fair bit essentially. And you can Corona see- Corona might help you bring it down to the model, the data to the model. So, say that again, Cecilia. Corona will help you bring the data down to the- <laughs> Maybe, maybe that's gonna reverse a lot of this. Uh, yeah, as, I mean, essentially we wrote the paper the, the day before Corona started essentially. Um, all right, uh, sectorally, I mean, we just the ICT price decline gets you the aggregate movements in the college and non-college worker ratio across sectors, but you can kind of see here what's going on across space. Like I was saying, you don't get the full increase in the non-college non-college worker ratio in the top density decile bins, but you get it pretty much right just from these these aggregate movements in ICT. So I think the model kind of does well there. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch more stuff in the paper that I didn't really get time to, to today, but maybe I'll leave a little bit of time for, for some chat. Um, so the model essentially we think of as a unified explanation for the new urban bias. It successfully generates urban bias wage growth just from one macro change and replicates the labor supply responses fairly well in the aggregate and across regions. Fall short in the, in the kind of the largest cities and, and I kind of discussed what we think might be going on there. I mean, to conclude, I mean, just to set this paper in context, that at least for most of history, if you think about the era of manufacturing, there was broadly one of widely shared growth where, you know, both skill types and, and many regions benefited somewhat broadly from, from productivity growth. Um, this SSS led economic growth that we're seeing now or in recent decades just looks kind of fundamentally different. It looks like some superstar regions and workers are seeing rapid wage growth in these particular sectors and it's not being shared across space. And the flip side is, you know, smaller places and less skilled workers really don't seem to be benefiting that much from, from, from these technological changes. Um, and it's a kind of an open question with Corona and, and with everything that's going on where this is eventually going to lead us. But I'd love to take any, any questions in these last couple of minutes if you have any. I'll, I'll bite, which is, I, I don't think this is actually the right alternative hypothesis, but I'd be interested in sort of understanding which pieces of your model help distinguish between different stories. So suppose yeah. I believed in the uh, superstar cities like Yorko, Mayer, Sinai story, where it's all about the combination of heterogeneous housing supplies. So like one city is very inelastic housing supply and the other is very elastic and then just top income growth. So everybody's got these idiosyncratic preferences and then it was the SSS, the finance guys got richer in the national income distribution, but then, so what, what moments that you showed me would that story hit? And then what moments would it miss so that I need to believe your thing instead of something that's all about housing supply? Yeah, I mean, essentially like hidden in what you said, it, it, is, it is a production story essentially, interacting with some static housing supply. Like there has to be a reason for top income growth in SSS and not outside SSS that has to be driving this. It can't just be that housing supply elasticity 
got tighter in dense cities and nothing was going on in the production side, because then we should see, you know, sectors acting somewhat similarly in response to changing housing supplies when you control for their, their skill compositions. I yeah, mean, I mean, Giorgio Meyer sinai didn't have sectors, so I'm trying to shove it in there. But basically, if you yeah. take the income distribution and say the people high in the income are work in distribution are working in SSS and then other sectors are, you know, different parts of the income distribution, wouldn't I get something of that flavor where hold the elasticity is constant? There's this cross section of San oh. Francisco's always been hard to build. Uh, but then like you anoint some winners that suddenly have much higher incomes and therefore higher willingness to pay for their preferred spot. They move to San Francisco and, you know, you get the wage growth, but they're tagged as yeah. SSS people. So you see wage growth for those people, but it's really just, they're indulging their preferences in the kind of Giorgio et al story. Fair. I, I think there's two different things going on there. Like if this was purely a preference story and say like, uh, skilled workers started loving cities more, you should see the kind of the opposite thing, actually. You should see wages fall, particularly for the top top income earners in SSS in New York. Um, but yeah, again, like there's some reason why the top income earners in SSS are seeing wage growth, right? Um, and, you know, we, we're thinking about a reason why that is. Maybe we don't have the exact right reason, but I think it's pretty good. Uh, part of this as well, changing housing supply elasticities, like I was saying before, you know, yeah, that, that kind of gives you some counterfactual predictions across industries if, if everyone has the same sort of uh, exposure to housing supply elasticities. But I agree, if, if you, some elements of it are there, but if you distinguish different parts of the story, I think you get kind of what we're saying, uh, that it can't be preferences alone, it can't be housing supply elasticity alone, something has to be happening on the production side, and it has to be happening in these four nice two-digit sectors, so. That's how I right. So I, I think I think putting those pieces together, I mean, at least for people very inside this literature, putting those pieces of evidence together to help you distinguish between competing sure. hypotheses is really helpful. Okay, Thanks. good. No, that's a great comment. I think we need to do a bit more of that paper. <clears throat> I'll follow up on that. With, um, so the ICT story is a, glo is a global one. So um, I was chatting with Fabian about this. T to what extent is this this um, this steepening uh, wage gradient. density gradient, um, a global one. Um, and can you, can you sort of compare like using variation across countries, the, the amount that this is steepening with the fall in ICT? Yeah, I would love to know the answer to that question. And we're trying, like right now, we're kind of trying to see if the same story holds in Europe. Mm -hmm. The thing is you have to kind of stitch together different data sets in Europe and we're having a little bit of trouble doing that. But I agree, like that would be, if, if we show that, that's an additional validation of our story that, you know, you're exactly right. If, I don't know essentially whether the urban wage gradient in Europe has steepened, uh, but I would like to know that. So if anyone can point me in any papers or any data sources in that direction, I would love to know that. Yeah, I, I should just say to that, we did have a little bit of a look at Europe and, you know, as Connor says, it, the data is really hard to reconcile across countries because these nuts regions are really differently sized across countries and the data availability is a little bit different. There is, we have some preliminary evidence that, that you see the same thing in Europe. There's also a recent paper by, by Lisa Giannone, who I think is in, in the chat too, who, you know, on global, on, on divergence across regions, across countries in the world. And I think she also finds that countries that are transitioning into services see, you know, regional divergence. So we see that as a follow-up work or like very much in line with our story here for the United mm -hmm. States. Okay. I have a question about what makes something a service. Hmm. Um, I mean, relative to Fabian's other work here, a service, this doesn't have to be a service. This is, you know, traded costlessly, uh, just like everything right. else. Um, there's nothing special about services. You're just putting a label um, yeah, you're right. I'm putting a label on it and I'm saying these skilled services are things that are, partic are particularly productive in users of ICT. But you're right, there's no, nothing that makes the service special beyond that in this paper, I think. As in, yeah, there's nothing about tradability being more difficult or less difficult than, than goods here, there's, as in Fabian's work. Um, we're just labeling this as kind of different production technologies. Yeah, I think it's, in some sense, this is very intentional because 
you know, you know the, the uh, you know Violant Grossel uh, or paper where they explain the rise in the aggregate college wage premium through a decline in ICT prices, effectively. And in some sense, we wanted to see can we amend this macro story with regions and use exactly the same shock and not talk about you know specificities of of of, of, of sectors, so to say. And, and kind of explain this additional element of, of faster you know, urban wage premium growth in addition to faster skilled wage premium growth, somehow casting both of these as a kind of features of unequal growth that seem to be associated with the decline in ICT prices. So on this, this kind of Twitter aid on Doran's comment, it seems like there is, there is something that shifts the labor demand across regions differentially. Right. And it's kind of two explain like Dorian said another explanation. There's one explanation about ICT, but that is this kind of a fair description of what's going on here? It is. We're, we're modeling differential labor demand shifts through global changes in the price of ICT. And then so then maybe kind of following up how, and maybe Jonathan's question too, how, okay, so you're backing up this from the data, but how would you distinguish from other explanations that could yeah. be, or maybe it's kind of a universal approach where you say, okay, maybe that's, they, they would all look similar to something like we did with the universal gravity thing. So they look all like labor demand shocks. But here there's a labor demand shock that's differential across regions. You're right. I mean, you're right in one sense that like it has to be a labor demand shock and it has to be biased towards SSS. The, the ICT element we think is very natural, but we can't rule out other things going on, maybe tradability, like in Fabian's paper. Um, but yeah, whatever your story has to be, it has to come from these biased labor demand shocks, we think, to match the data. Well, maybe then you, you could just display it in that way. Say, here's a way to the, we explain many of these, exp we've incorporated many of these explanations yeah. and you can choose your own, but. Yeah. In, so, in some sense, what, what, we, what we like about the graphs that, that Connor showed, is that any explanation has to be, you know, ha has to feature this urban bias and it has to feature the sector bias. And there's a lot of explanation that kind of hit one of the two, but to get both of them at the same time is kind of hard, right? For example, anything that's specific to high skilled workers won't work because we don't see the same wage growth patterns for doctors across space, right? And so it can't be skill specific only. And so somehow working with these, you know, between these two graphs, there's actually quite a small set of explanations that, that, that works for both. I, yeah, um, I push back on that a little bit in the sense of the doctors aren't traded, right? So I guess, so like in my AER with Don Davis, we did this exercise where you have neutral, like the value of skilled people interacting goes up in a neutral way, but then it's obviously not spatially neutral because, you know, bigger cities are better at that. And I guess we, we had all of the skilled people working in the tradable sector, and then that wouldn't work if doctors are, you know, producing a non-tradable that would kind of be shut down. So I think that I sort of agree with the spirit of Costas's comment about try to be as general as possible about what generates the labor, neutral labor demand shift that has spatially uneven consequences. Right. But tradability then is really, that, that adds a piece that you want to, that, I mean, that's why you, you use, what's it called? Now you have it scalable skilled services. Wasn't the name, wasn't tradability in the name at STS? Wasn't that the acronym like two years ago? <laughs> it was. I think that, I think the tradability is kind of important. And that's the yeah. thing about the doctors is they're not tradable. Yeah, well, they are now. <laughs> Do you have a measure of kind of, um, how far the, the services in these industries travel I and is, whether that's even, even further than it was before. I mean, I, well, I'll let Fabian speak to it, but I think the thing you're kind of hampered with is like within us uh, trade flow data on services is kind of hard. So I mean, no, but we, we, of... we just saw a paper where we saw, uh, you know, trade in, in it was going across the world. Right. And so. Right. Um, right. Externally, you got this before. I mean, exports of ICT services and these SSS services has gone up massively. But just thinking about the tradability within the US is, is kind of you run into this, this data problem, I think. 
Is that right? I mean, like banking services and finance services, there's got to be a way of kind of measuring how that, you know, like fidelity is able to kind of expand everywhere. Um, you don't have a way of doing that? I mean, you can do it in, in a model, which is what Fabian does. It's just having the direct flows of fidelity across space. I, I'm not aware of it, but yeah. No, there's, there's, there's to my knowledge for the US, there's no data on, on, on service trade flows. Not even in any you know subsector of the service industry. There's, I mean, I... there's there's some survey some some surveys on the utilization of banking services. You know where do you get your banking from, kind of stuff. But that's it. There's not not more. I mean, you know, in some sense, we know it has to. These things have to be trading. Uh, going back to the concentration ratios we started with, almost two two and a half hours ago. We, if, if these industries are becoming more concentrated and people are not becoming a lot more concentrated, then it has to be that these things are kind of traveling further in some sense. So right. but th and that's, I think so, that's so what that's, the ICT does, right? Like I, I, have a, right. I have a bank on my computer now, right? So, so that was exactly the idea in my job market paper. It's to kind of compare the spatial concentration of producers versus demand. And yep. you see that, uh, you know, drifting apart in space, which kind of implies that they must be more traded, but yep. you don't see these trade flows in any data set that I'm aware of. You know, in, I think in Canada, we have some regional trade data, although probably much of it's made up. But if you, you know, there you see, you see it a little bit, but it's, uh, there is no great data that I'm aware of. And maybe these firm to firm, you know, VAT data sets could, could, could actually help with this. Yeah. Um, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the comments. Super, super helpful. Good. So it was interesting. Um, we said everyone had an hour, but everyone, um, when we when we adjusted the start times, um, no one adjusted their finish times. So it, um, we ended up right on time in the end. Um, so we were just going to leave leave it open as we always do in case people wanted to chat. Um, but we'll uh, um, we had three really great papers that um, kind of uh, look at IT in different ways with um, and you know it was a nice nice. Uh, group of papers. So uh, thanks to all the presenters and we'll just kind of call it quits, but we can kind of leave the stream open. Okay. But I agree on the assessment of the papers. A really nice conference. Thank you the, to the organizers also. No, thanks to the participants too. Yep, I think on, on behalf of the presenters, I, sh I should also thank the organizers. This was a really great uh, session for us to see all the papers together and also uh, get the feedback that we get, we got. Great. I have a last question for the first and the third paper, so I had to leave in the second, but what, so the production function you both use basically as a sifter that depends on the technology, it's like a productivity sifter, but depends on the scale, right? Exactly. And um, and that's true also for Connor, right? Is this? Yeah, that's, I mean, the, the relative skill productivity is depend on the scale. But, it, okay, but then you had two, sorry, this is kind of geeky, but like you had two Ys, you, Connor, had two Ys, and Daniel had one Y, <laughs> but I guess it's the same, right? You just kind of divide it's by like the... taking the one, right. one term, factoring one term and taking it out of the... Right, right, okay. But, it, okay, so the principle is like, as we change the scale, but then I guess you, Daniel, you, you applied it um, across firms and then you applied it and then Connor and Cothers applied it um, across space, I guess. We, sorry, I, that, I, Daniel and Cothers, sorry, I didn't notice where, they, where I didn't see that. Daniel and Cothers applied it across firms and then you, Connor and Cothers applied it across uh, space. space. And space. So we used it for, for IT versus non-IT. We're, we're yeah. at Connor and um, right, right. Yeah, uh, two and factors. And then, yeah. I skip, I skip. Uh, thanks for the clarification. Yeah. If you had more factors, and then then you could just apply it to more factors, right? I mean, this is kind of the logic applies to more factors. So you can for each factor, you can add one extra elasticity, output elasticity, essentially. Uh, of course, you can do it. The number of factors minus one, yeah. and number of parameters in total. Okay, thanks for the question. I had a follow-on question to Costas. I'm sorry I had to join late. I only caught Connor's. Um, 
going back to that production function, it, aren't there, there are implicate, I, I raised the issue before about whether um, you could, you, you'd want to put the location output rather than the firm output in there. And uh, I, maybe it doesn't make much difference in terms of the aggregates. You, you needed an assumption, I think about the thetas and the alphas being correlated to get you there. Um, I was just wondering if you needed that, if you put in agglomeration effects. But also going your way, aren't there implications for firm size? Um, and maybe you touched on that at the beginning, but I didn't, uh, or do you have any data on firm size and wouldn't that discipline? We do. And we think of it as sort of an out of model or out of sample validation. I mean, what you're going to see is the average firm size increases most in SSS in the largest cities. And that seems to be somewhat true in the data. So we can compare that directly to the model. Yeah, it'd be nice to, don't nice quite to, it, but, yeah. but the pattern is there, I think. Yeah, it'd be nice it would to be great to show that, yeah, to put it in the, in the slides, yeah. But there are no firms. Are there firms in your model, though? Yeah, they're heterogeneous firms. And they're, they're this, okay, no, well, police competition, I have, I have missed that. Yeah, so another data issue is you, you have the firms in, in this style of model popping up or disappearing in the locations. So you don't have a firm location choice like some of these models do. Not, not in the sense that firms comparing locations, we have a, an entry margin in which like as, as pro profitability goes up in these densest locations, you can get more firms in these locations. Right. But it would be interesting to see if if there are any data that informed us about whether these firms are just local apparitions. Yeah. Or I think Darren had a paper a few weeks ago where the firm choice was an issue, and it, and it may I don't know the extent to which this movement to the big cities is the decline of firms and the small ones and the growth and entry of firms and the big ones. And it seems your model has implications for that. And it would be interesting. I, it, I mean, it does on the establishment level, but we didn't model, like Dorian was saying, a span of control problem where you're putting establishments in different places. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I would love to. It's, it's hard. It's challenging. But I mm -hmm. think, I think it's, a, it's a nice thing to think about. I just have two uh, remaining questions, which are for both um, uh, the second paper and the third paper. Um, I kind of maybe a bit fluffy, but in terms of welfare, so for the second paper, um, I was kind of a bit fuzzy on, you know, whether there might, you know, this the probability of emigrating to the U.S. is is sort of small so maybe the impacts are small and could we think about there being some probability of emigrating to the US which maximizes welfare for India given the mechanisms that you uh, have. Are, are you thinking more like uh, something like a planner's problem? Uh, yeah that, yeah yeah I think yeah I think that the way we were thinking about it in the paper is more you know the, the the gap is completely exogenous to whatever happens in India as determined by the US by political factors. But I think you could think uh, there's a point in which whatever gains India is getting from the spillover will get netted just by the fact that wages are starting to go up because it's need to demand more labor. Uh, so it's, it's, it's definitely not just like completely increasing forever. Like, I mean, I don't know, we, we couldn't have something like a, a gigantic probability of migration. So it's probably like a point in with the probability. Yeah, I mean, it would be an interesting exercise, I think, to, to the planet's problem. And find that we haven't done that yet, but because it just seems kind of surprising on an intuitive level that this small probability—I mean, okay, it's not a trivial probability, but you know, small probability could have like a really big. What what's the externality there that there could be a really big impact on India from just giving people this small option to migrate to the U.S.? That seems think, kind of like, surprising that that would have a big impact. In reality, I think you generally see it whenever, for example, um, there was talks, you know, like the first visit of the Indian prime minister with Trump, 
part of the talks they were doing was like making sure that immigration wasn't going to be stopped. And, you know, like immigration was such a big deal because in India, in fact, they know that immigration to the U.S. is actually very beneficial for them. The reason it's restricted is more just because of U.S. decisions that immigration is very restricted. But I think if, if it would be up to India, they would definitely expand that. No, 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 for sure. But just in terms of what are the mechanisms in the model that this flow, which is a small number of people given the size of India, um, yeah, yeah. have a, a non-trivial impact? I, I think the main thing is in the model is that spillover term where computer scientists expand the productivity of IT. Uh, and I was I kind of wondering what's what's disciplining that and what happens when you shut that down to your welfare measures? Because that seems to be sort of key for this thing. And that was the part that I was kind of like a little bit. Yeah, so, so we estimate that parameter of the spillover um, using, pa using patents and a shock to labor supply uh, in order to estimate it. But our estimate is, is consistent with other estimates in the literature in terms of spillover of computer scientists in, in technology. Um, so what we show is that if you completely shut down the spillover, actually India loses from uh, this immigration because people are getting into computer science, but it's not a particular productivity driven from computer science. So actually they're just getting, you know, they lose college graduates and they're getting more of a skill that they don't necessarily need. Um, but as long as you have like a small spillover, we try with different magnitudes of the spillover as robustness. As long as you even have like a small spillover, it already generates this brain gain that, that we talk about in, in, in the model. So even if you use a spillover below whatever we're estimating, um, it's already enough to create uh, this gain of acquiring skills of computer science. But... Then I wanted to ask to uh, uh, Connor. Um... Hey, Dorian, can I just follow up on that for a second? Are, are you appropriately accounting for like the costs of, of accumulating that that technology? I mean, I, I think that's I think that's that's sort of the surprising thing to me. I, you know, in the sense that. These guys are all taking a, a draw for the lottery to, yeah. to, to win, but the guys who are left, they just paid for it and they didn't get, they didn't actually get it. So you, I would have thought that, you know, if you properly account for the resources they gave up to sort of shift into like this other field where they took a loss, um, and maybe uh, this uh, is what you were saying for about the, the externality, but. I mean, it, in our welfare calculations, that's, that, that's part of what we're doing. Like when we calculate the welfare, it's actually people that are switching. I mean, they get some penalty on the wage uh, but they also get a penalty in, in terms of utility. They need to pay a fixed cost uh, in order to switch uh -huh. occupations and all that. And that's accounted for in our welfare calculations. So, so it's really just, you know, um, you shift um, with like a different policy and then you're, you're starting measuring things right from when the shift happens. And so really it's, um, you're accounting for all the costs that are going. Yeah, in sense the, the spillover generated like by computer scientists is enough to compensate for the costs that are born of gotcha. workers that lose the lottery and stay. Like. Okay, all right. thanks. Sorry, Dorian. No, it's okay. So, so then to uh, uh, Connor, I just wanted to ask, you know, we just kind of literature on place-based policies for in models where there's agglomeration. And since you don't have the agglomeration is that this, everything's efficient. And everything's there's no, efficient. There's no okay, so this, need to, do anything right. about place-based policies in this world, at least. That's a pity for policymakers. They don't have a job. Yeah, I mean, exactly. They're, everyone's always asking, "What is this? What? Where's the place-based policy?" And sometimes there is none. <laughs> Good. All right. Um, anyone else? No? 